The Rogue Invitational is all done. You, like many of me, probably spent every waking moment of every second of this weekend watching that thing go down. So in order, I'm going to give you the three things that I thought could have been better, followed by the five things that I thought were done very well at the Rogue Invitational. But first, I want to give you what I think were my biggest surprises. I understand that being in shape comes in ebbs and flows, and I understand that programming plays a very large part. But when it comes to CrossFit and fitness in particular, you come to expect a very almost similar style leaderboard. And for the most part, that does happen, but the biggest surprise is when you take those things into account, you're used to seeing the same names at the top of the leaderboard. I expect to see Justin Medeiros a little bit higher. I think a lot of people did as well. And the same thing goes for Patrick Vellner. People are going to say, yeah, he's traveling, he's, but he's always traveling. He's always got stuff going on. He is getting older, and you're always kind of starting to think of maybe this is the time at which he starts going downhill a little bit, because when you get older, you have to be getting less fit. On the women's side, you see Daniel Brandon and Haley Adams. That one you might be able to chalk up to the fact that the Rogue Invitational is a little bit heavier than events like the CrossFit Games. But those were just some surprising names that are a little bit lower on the leaderboard than you would have expected. Now on to the bad stuff. Everybody loves the bad stuff. It's kind of a suiting area that I'm in. If you use some deductive reasoning and you follow along with the YouTube channel before, you may know exactly where I am. And if you stay tuned to the YouTube channel for a couple of the days, it's very timely. Incredibly unfortunate, but timely. The Achilles ruptures, number three in the bad list. We're gonna go three, two, one. Gotta give kudos to Rogue for changing the event mid-event to that burpee over that 48-inch hay bale box looking thing. But you gotta ask what it was doing there in the first place. I personally think that you should take the reins off of the athletes. There's a lot of people who are throwing the GHD my way. Like, look at where Emily Rolf's butt is. Emily already with an obvious faster cycle rate. You're really seeing two contrasting styles here on these GHD between Spiegel and Rolf. And then I'm thinking, as far as I know, the only time in which they've really standardized where your butt needs to be in relation to the pad on the GHD was the quarterfinal workout of 2023. Maybe it was 2022. That's where I met Bill Leahy. That was Kill Bill Volume 1. You know, the V sit-up workout where he's getting off the row a little bit earlier and then he was putting his butt in the right spot, but half of the freaking planet had their butt on the wrong side of the GHD. And the reason I'm talking about that is because implementing some Something like a step down on a box jump over takes the athleticism component out of it. But also athletes come to expect the fact that you're going to be taking care of their Achilles tendon. So maybe they don't have the volume built up to take care of those things. I wrote somewhere that I likened it to the self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't work on your rebounding ability, and then when you need to rebound in an event, you're screwed. And also, I don't really remember all that many Achilles ruptures in the 2012 to 20, even 20 range. So eight years where there weren't very many of them. And then you started to put the reins on the athletes. Don't worry, we're going to step down everything. Unless all of a sudden we say you don't have to, and then you're not trained for it, then you blow that thing out. Oh, well. Self-fulfilling prophecy. That's number three for me. The Achilles ruptures. I think Henrik confirmed that he had thought that it had happened. Gabby spoke about it on Be Friendly Fitness a little bit. They seem to be in relatively good spirits. And like I said, I'm with somebody right now who is five months into their own recovery process on one of those things. So stay tuned to that. Number two bad thing. They were a good test and it was a terrible spectacle. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Event number one knocked it out of the park and everybody who was singing the praises of how the cameras were cutting at the right points in time, the bags moving around were cool and you're able to follow the race. I say the race and I say the race because then when you get to an event, I don't remember what event it was, but it started and ended with a 1000 meter row. And that's okay until you remember that everyone's pulling at the same pace on that final row. And it's like, all right, well, we saw them all get off of the thruster. And now we got to wait three to four minutes for them to get off of the rower. Did anything really change? No, not so much. Same thing goes on that shuttle sprint workout with the North Sea Tiger workout. Did anything really change over the course of those six shuttle runs? It's like, no, not really. Was there a better way to do it? Yeah, probably. Am I inherently against these shuttle runs? No, I'm not. But why does it look like there was almost no urgency from a lot of the athletes? There were no position changes on those shuttle runs. There were no position changes on the rower. And while the workouts look like they were phenomenal tests, they were very bad to watch. And the reason I brought up the camera changes in event one is because they got particularly bad when it got to the Braveheart workout. Out. It was like, we're going to watch this guy unrack or this girl unrack this bar. And then all of a sudden they cut to somebody else who was unracking a bar. It's like, well, we want to watch them squat. We don't want you to watch them prepare and tighten their belt and get ready to squat. We want to watch them squat. Andrew, you're talking about it from somebody who watched everything. It's like, yeah, that's good feedback too. That's my number two. They were great tests and it was almost a terrible spectacle once you got down to it. I started calling the shuttle runs irrelevant runs. It's like, all right, we're going to do six irrelevant runs for time. Like, all right, well, why don't we just get rid of them? It doesn't matter! And then the number one worst thing about the 
Rogue Invitational. And I think that a lot of you guys will be like, no, oh, how did I not think that that was the worst thing? It's the duel. And it's not inherently the duel as an event. It's the duel with the rest time, the break time between them. Unfortunately enough for Rogue, the same day that the duel was going down, so was NFL football. And the thing that NFL football has got going for it is this thing called Red Zone. I introduced Bill Leahy and company to Red Zone. The reason being, I'm trying to watch the Bears and we don't have local coverage, so I can't watch the Bears. I'm just waiting for the Bears to pop onto the screen. And I'm waiting for them to get into the Red Zone, you know, the exciting portion of time. But in the meantime, what you get to do is you get to watch some other team play. You get to watch some other team play. You get to see an interception, a sack, you name it. And I know I'm comparing apples and oranges here, and I usually don't like doing that, but there is nothing worse than watching a couple of heats go where they last for 20, 30 seconds, very similar to a football ball play followed by a 10 to 15 minute break where nothing's happening. Something has to be happening between those things. It's a three hour event where for the majority of it, you're just sitting there waiting for them to tabulate the scores and figure out who's going into the next round. It's like, how freaking hard can it be? I don't know. Maybe someone knows how hard it was, but what I'm telling you is that from the watching angle of it, it's the worst. I did like the power steps though. The power steps were pretty cool. I do think that it would have been wild if you had increased the weight of the power pin on the power steps every round. And I think the chicks were using 220 so you go 220 230 240 250 and you're just bumping that thing up every single round so you're throwing a monkey wrench into the way that the athletes are moving on that thing same thing goes for the dudes 300 310 320 just let it keep going maybe the chicks go up by five instead of tens because 250 seems like it'd be dangerously close to that 300 pound weight that then we're starting with i'm done talking about the bad stuff we're gonna start talking about the things that i liked about the rogue invitational and we're gonna start with an honorable mention because i don't think it deserves a spot in my list but i really was fond of looking at the broadcast and not being able to really figure out how many people were there. I don't know if they did this on purpose, but you see the giant black rogue invitational wall. I thought that was phenomenal. That was cool looking. And then as you look, it seems like there's a buttload of people. And from what I heard from people who were there, there was a buttload of people there. But then when you're looking at it, they're kind of blacked out. It gives it this noir super stadium aura. Looking around, it's like, wow, it just looks like it's vast. It just keeps going like the sea. You're looking at the ocean in the middle of the night, it just goes on forever. So that was honorable mention. It was just a very cool look for the broadcast. And we'll get back to the broadcast broadcast on the actual list itself in a second. I was a big fan of the event finale, and that's number five, the sandbag clean ladder. I'm always a pretty big fan of them throwing a wrench into the, oh, we need to have a barbell clean. We gotta have this, that. We're come to expect these things. Rogue's particularly good at that. Very similar to the 20, I believe it was 18 regional, where there were no barbells. It was all dumbbells, and everyone's losing their minds. Like, it's too late. It's the weak man games. The Weak Man Games was the 2024 CrossFit Games, not the 2018 semifinal, and definitely not the Rogue Invitational. Nobody was claiming that the Rogue Invitational was the Weak Man Invitational, but that was a pretty cool spin on the typical 30 reps that you'll do, and I liked that it had a little bit of pizzazz to where the final placings would be. Albeit there was no surprise when somebody like Tia ends up winning again, but you're thinking, oh, maybe Laura can take her. For some reason or another, you think that. Just like for some reason or another, Tia thinks that she's the freaking underdog. Number four. I told you I would come back to the stream. And this time I'm not talking about the way of the audience. Look, I'm talking about the premium stream. It's 20 bucks. And for 20 bucks, you can see any athlete you want the entire time. They have this virtual reality thing where you kind of just click around. It's like they had an Insta360 and it gives you this giant panorama view. There are a couple of cameras on every event. You click on it and once you've clicked on it, you can drag the screen and you can kind of just look around. This helped me do something later on this list, which again, we're going to get back to. But it's one of the biggest criticisms of anybody anywhere is I didn't get to see so-and-so do whatever for whenever I wanted to do it and Rogue has cleared that thing up. I didn't hear anybody talking about that, but it's a phenomenal feature that I've really only seen from Rogue. For 20 bucks, you can watch your sister, your brother, or anybody do anything you want whenever you want them to do it. They can finish dead last in the heat and you can cheer them on the entire time for the first time ever. And also, everyone loved that Sean Woodland was back and it was good to hear Sean's voice, but if for some reason you're a Sean Woodland hater, you can go behind the scenes and you can watch Josh Bridges and company eat shepherd's pie or haggis or whatever they were eating while they were watching the event, like the Iron Game coverage. It's like, hey, we got the B team and we're going to feed them and you're going to listen to them chew while they talk about double unders. So that was cool too. Gives you the option of who you want to hear talking about what you want to talk about. Number three, how many bad judging calls did you see? The thing that I really wasn't all that fond of is that there wasn't a great relay between what was happening on the field to what was going on with the broadcast or what they were saying in the broadcast. It takes a lot of deductive reasoning and timing to figure out that Danny Spiegel misplaced her 
power pin on the first round. So it's like, she won her heat. Why isn't she in the next round of it after the 20 minute wait? Well, it's because she had placed the power pin on the red line and supposedly you're not allowed to do that. It's gonna give you a 10 second penalty and knocks you completely out of the event. Finished 18th place. Huge miss because she probably could end up winning the freaking thing. And similarly enough, our favorite character, Danny Spiegel, had something going on with her double under event. There were three rounds of 100 on her first couple of rounds via the premium stream. You're able to see that she was only doing 75 to 78, I believe, happened on the first round. Top of my head, I think it was 78. And then I believe it was 88 on the second round. And then for some reason, on the third round, everything goes correctly. She gets 100 double unders. Why does she get 100 double unders? Well, a head judge comes on over and all of a sudden they nail in the number of double unders that she's supposed to be doing. And the reason I'm using this as an example is because other than that, and even in that instance in particular, they're doing everything they can to get everything right. And there were no judging mishaps over the course of the weekend. And that's number three. The judging was phenomenal with the Rogue Invitational. The number two good thing, the battle between Tia and Laura, which should have been the battle between Tia, Laura, and Gabby. Gabby was on a war path. When you do only, what was it, five and a half of the events, and you still finish in eighth or ninth place like she did, it means that you were having a phenomenal weekend. And she was right up there with the both of them for all of it. It sucks that she wasn't able to finish, but it's great. And my number two point, Tia and Laura were going at it head to head. And like I said, I thought that there was a chance that maybe for some reason, Tia isn't as good with the sandbag as some of the other chicks. I was wrong again about that. And maybe Laura is phenomenal with the sandbag, which she wasn't as good as I figured she would be. But the sheer fact that there was a chance that Laura beats Tia again, and maybe that's why Tia thought she was the underdog. That was cool. It was almost as cool as that wicked gap between second and third place. Ariel Lowen takes third place, but she she was almost 300 points behind or something. It was like 480 to 700, 220 points. You ever see the movie Gattaca? Kind of older. It's a crazy concept to it where they got to make this guy taller and they just bust his knee so he gets a couple inches taller so he can go into space. That's maybe what has to happen to Laura Horvath when it comes to her handstand push. There's just something anatomically wrong with her and you just got to bust something so that all of a sudden she's got the limblings to make her okay at handstand push-ups and then she can push Tia maybe a year later. I'm going to take a step backwards. I'm going to shorten my forearm so all of a sudden I'm going to destroy Tia or just pray that there are no handstand push-ups at whatever event we're doing. My number one absolute best thing that happened at the Rogue Invitational, I guess it didn't really happen at it, although it was it, it was a better test of fitness than the 2024 CrossFit Games. I'm not talking mental fortitude. I don't give a crap about your mental fortitude. Everybody could have been happy hunky dory at the CrossFit Games, and if you just look at the events for what they are, absolute garbage as a test of fitness. I alluded to it earlier. The 2018 regional was not the strong little man regional. That was the 2024 CrossFit Games. And I'm saying that this was a better test of fitness. It didn't take very much for it to be a better test of fitness. I'm going to say that because I still think that this wasn't the ultimate test of fitness. Bill and his roommate Colin are still doing this thing where they re watch and rewatch every single CrossFit game since the dawn of time. They watched every single event, every second of it. Bill's over there taking notes, but they're currently on the year 2022 and we're sitting there like, wow, this is a pretty slept on games. That was the year at the sandbag clean ladder. It was the year that Bob been programmed. They were talking highly about the shuttle to the overhead workout, and I'm thinking, damn, compare 2022 to 2024, and there is no comparison. And if you compare the nine events of the Rogue Invitational, which aren't enough, and maybe if you add another four or five events to the Rogue Invitational, it'd be the most phenomenal test of fitness of all time. But that, in my opinion, was the best thing about it. We're looking at you, James Sprague, in particular. I don't know how many times they need to say it. Love the freak out of James Sprague. He's the CrossFit Games champion. It's hard to believe that he's the fittest on Jeff Adler comes in, does what he needs to do. I know that James had pneumonia. It's freaking awesome that that dude put himself on the line as the fittest on earth, to put that in quotes. But I'm sitting over here thinking, let's take 15% off the top. Let's give him one to three placings per event. Finish at 11th overall, and if you give him 15 points per event, which is incredibly generous, and you give him an additional 135 points, where does he finish? I want to get all this right. 560, he's still in eighth place. To be the fittest on earth, you're supposed to be able to overcome the unknown and unknowable. Be able to surmount any single task that is thrown in your face. And I don't think that pneumonia is going to affect you all that much on a workout with handstand walk, wall walk, handstand push-up complexes and 375 back squats. And I'm not even talking about the barbell because we know James is a little bit weaker, but I'm talking about the handstand push-up. And he was failing on the handstand push-ups. It was also the crux in Fikowski's second place finish. If he had done better on the wall facing handstand push-up complex, he would have beaten Jeff Adler. He got 18th place on that. If he finishes top five, he wins the freaking Rogue Invitational like I kind of thought that he maybe would. So that's a massive hole in the fitness, a hole that Jeff Adler didn't have. Jeff Adler, the actual fittest man on earth. But he didn't finish the CrossFit Games. He's mentally weak. I forgot where mental toughness is one of the 10 components of fitness. And that's really all I have to say about that. And really.